right? Well, we've set a new standard here in panel seven with the panel cheer. Uh, <laughs> cheering to keep the pace up as we, uh, as we move to today. I'm Sean Sullivan here at the Ward College. This is my uh, fourth uh, conference as either a presenter or a moderator. And I want to say thanks to my great friend and uh, golf partner, Mary Rahm. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, the thing about this is uh, Mary's office and mine are close enough proximity. So um, with, uh, what you get to see is conference Mary. What I get to see is planning Mary. And so the, the two are, are they, they look remarkably the same, but uh, not necessarily so. But uh, one thing I do get to see every year is the amount of energy and commitment that Mary has, not just to the topic, but to our program, to uh, make it go so well. And uh, she is a force. And so I, I'm really happy that I can, uh, I can work for her again. Now, uh, this panel, it's, uh, it's an interesting topic. And that, uh, one of the things is, is um, uh, this, these conferences do great at uh, developing for us in women, peace, and security issues kind of a, uh, an understanding of some of the common terminologies. Because we all, whether you're NGO, IGO, government, non-government, whether you're military or, uh, or, or uh, civilian, we have our own terms. And uh, this panel, when it, when it starts talking about uh, international uh, operations and tactics and the perspectives, is that, uh, is that for centuries, uh, strategists, policymakers have kind of uh, looked at international politics, foreign relations, military operations from really three lenses. And the first lens was called the strategic level of warfare. That's what they call it, strategic level of politics. And that's where national leaders make decisions and, uh, and policies. And what they then do is turn to the operational and tactical leaders to then do the difficult part, which is implementation and, uh, and actually execution, where these operational and tactical leaders and organizations, they pursue, and hopefully with good planning, achieve the uh, strategic objectives of our of our strategic level leaders. So today I'm joined by, uh, by four panelists. The first is Commander Suzanne Maynard from the United States Navy. She's currently serving in the, uh, on the U.S. Joint Staff in Washington, D.C. On her right is Lieutenant Colonel Marie Eve Benet from the Canadian Forces. On her right, Professor Maria Vilchez de Vantro, and she's from the University of Grenada. And, uh, at the far end is uh, Bob. I told her I wouldn't call her Bob. I, it's, uh, it's Miss Anna Davis. And what you can tell right now is that that introduction demonstrated my uh, challenge in uh, several languages, one of which is, of course, French, Canadian, Russian, and Spanish. But the big problem is the English part of this. So what we'll do is uh, we'll start with uh, Commander Maynard. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, hello everyone, my name is Suzanne Maynard. Um, I first want to thank the Naval War College for holding this important conference series and for Mary uh, for inviting me to sit this panel. I had reservations at first because I've only been on the Joint Staff since April um, and I still feel like I have a lot to learn. Um, but this is an important topic and it's an honor just to be a part of the discussion, uh, which I hope to contribute positively to today. So I come to you as an action officer on the Joint Staff, where I hold the Women, Peace, and Security portfolio, among several other portfolios. Um, so my goal for this panel is to give you all an overview of the way the US has structured their approach to WPS within DOD, one of the three federal agencies charged with implementing the 1325 UNSCR and its associated resolutions. Um, I also would like to highlight a few operational vignettes that you might have heard of, heard of before, but I find them particularly compelling to the WPS agenda, and then leave you with some of our initiatives and challenges for the future. So as we all know, WPS is a portfolio that encompasses the 2000 UNSCR 1325 and its associated resolutions recognizing the unique and disproportionate impact that armed conflict has on women and girls and calls on nations to recognize this fact and take certain actions in support of the WPS agenda. At higher headquarters policy level, DOD recognizes WPS by assigning the portfolio to desk officers in both the secretarial office as well as the joint staff, that's me, with the office of the Secretary of Defense um, policy as the lead, represented here today by Amanda Van Dorp, who's hiding in the back, um, we have her on loan from the State Department, um, but she's been both an ally and a workforce for WPS during the few short months that she's been with us. 
Um, so she's here representing OSD. Both of us together comprise the higher headquarters end of the spectrum and we're, we're responsible for things like policy development, instructions, policy memos, implementation plans, etc. And uh, coordination of efforts across the DOD domain. Uh, we enact the President's National Action Plan for the Department of Defense at the agency level. We also coordinate the DOD portion of the annual WPS report to the President. Um, and finally, we're responsible for interagency coordination at our level with the other two government agencies charged with implementing WPS per the National Action Plan. So namely with the uh, State Department, who's represented here today by my colleague, Lieutenant Commander Kim Jones, also hiding in the back of there. Um, and also uh, USAID, represented by Jennifer Hawkins. So OS, OSD and I coordinate with, we also coordinate with WPS representatives or leads from each of the combatant commands, the uniformed services, the five Defense Security Cooperation Agency Regional Centers, or DISCO Regional Centers. Um, those are the Marshall Center, the Perry Center, etc. Um, and the educational institutions. We meet once a month to discuss updates within the community of interest across the department and uh, coordinate efforts. Um, each organization, each of those organizations has their own network of WPS actors and initiatives depending upon where they lie on the spectrum um, and they have their own coordination events further down the chain as required. Okay, so that's sort of the overall structure. Um, DOD has translated the verbiage of the National Action Plan into five objectives corresponding with the NAP, institutionalization, participation, protect, protection, conflict prevention, and access. So these can be found outlined in the DOD implementation plan currently being updated to align with the new 2016 NAP. So to transition from strategic discourse to some operational examples, um, I want to thank PKSO, at PKSOI up front for collecting and processing these particular stories. They're currently working on another WPS Lessons Learned sampler, um, the draft of which is where I was able to study these cases. So, first one, um, I love this story from Central Command. It's a great example of integrating a gender perspective. Uh, in 2014, a U.S. military communications group developed an extensive radio program for eastern Afghanistan to consistently communicate the military campaign with the Afghan people. The efforts for the broadcast to be culturally sensitive were exhaustive. However, all the trainings and briefings and, missions and mission analyses failed to take into account that the majority of the listeners were women during the day as the men were out and about working, uh, farming, or fighting. So even though Afghan women play key roles in society, usually from behind the scenes, they have been completely omitted from consideration because the planners only interacted with the Afghan men. After a tip from a female engagement team familiar with the local population of women, the program's content was adjusted to account for this missing gender dimension. Um, many mothers and babies were dying in childbirth, as a, and a primary concern of the Afghan women in this, these communities was health care. So for culture, but for cultural and religious reasons, these Afghan women were not comfortable going to a male doctor, and many of the female doctors um, had either fled or been killed. So based on the needs of the community and the listeners, the communications group commander decided to dedicate two hours a day to female physicians. Um, they saw incidents of death in childbirth and infant mortality decrease by 50% across eastern Afghanistan. So tip line calls to the radio also increased, indicating a victory within the hearts and minds of the Afghan people. So due to a simple shift in gender consideration, many lives were saved and the overall campaign saw progress. So another, <clears throat> another positive example from Central Command for the 10 years between 2003 and 2013 involves the National Solidarity Program, or NSP, which became the largest development program in Afghanistan and speaks to the participation objective. During the decade this program was active, over 65,000 development projects were financed, reaching 361 districts in, Afghans, in Afghanistan's 34 provinces, creating a total of 32,000 community development councils, or CDCs, within villages. These CDCs were required to have a specific quota of women's participation in local governance decisions in order for block grants to be funded. This ensured women, as well as men, would have a say in the development projects and services that would affect their lives. They increased access to drinking water and electricity, improved women's access to education, healthcare, counseling services, and increased male acceptance for female participation in public life. Uh, made projects more relevant to the needs of the community, and finally proved more effective for achieving overall regional stability. So those are a couple of posit positive examples. 
um, from the front lines. We've accomplished much in, in these areas, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, this next example that I have is from the African continent. It's a little bit dated, so I apologize for that, but I still find it fascinating, and I think it speaks boldly to the good, to good intentions, but the criticality of integrating a gender perspective, specifically uh, in the access to relief and recovery objective. So, following the Loan Peace Accord, the, the uh, Demobilization, Disarmament, and Reintegration, or DDR, program in Sierra Leone, lasting from 1999 to 2004, saw over 75,000 adult soldiers and more than 6,800 child soldiers participate in this DDR process. Um, it was administered by UN Peacekeeping Mission in Sierra Leone and has widely been lauded as a model for DDR success. We've already heard a little bit about women as combatants and why they do it during the medical panel this morning. Women played a significant part in the 11-year civil war in Sierra Leone from 91 to 2002. Some joined voluntarily and many achieved high military ranks, led lethal attacks, fighting and killing, in addition to often acting as sex slaves. Even though exact numbers of females involved in the fighting in Sierra Leone remain unknown, estimates range from 10 to 50 percent of the armed factions. Even so, only 6% of the 75,000 adult soldiers in the DDR program were women. There are several presumed reasons for this because of its narrow definition of women's roles in armed conflict as victims rather than uh, recognizing their gender identity transformation as a result of their roles in the armed conflict. Women largely avoided the DDR process as they didn't address their distinct needs or concerns. Many women were not eligible because they were requ required to turn in a gun. Many of them had to share weapons during the conflict or use an alternate weapon such as a machete. Some commanders deliberately took weapons from the women and girls to preclude their eligibility in the DDR process. In other cases, the demarcation between child and adult was based on the international standards and didn't make sense in the local context. Many of the young women had already had children but were not considered adults by the community due to a certain, tradi certain traditional ceremonies not being completed. Um, yet they didn't consider themselves children either because they, had, they already had a child of their own. So they fell into sort of a no-man's land and because of this ambiguity, they also avoided the program altogether. So women were often sidelined out of post-conflict policies. Their training options post-conflict were often very gendered and not particularly lucrative, a stark contrast to the active and, and respective role they played in the rebel forces. Um, there were situations where they were prevented from participating in the DDR program due to eligibility, and they also feared community retaliation for participating. The overwhelming message from interviewees from this conflict was that there was no post-conflict for, for many female soldiers in Sierra Leone. Different forms of violence, such as forced marriage, sexual exploitation, and isolation continued despite the cessation of formal conflict. The DDR process, although internationally highly praised, primarily benefited men, completely ignoring the specific needs of the women to be reintegrated into the community. So that, those, those are my examples that I wanted to share with you. Um, now back to the strategic level a little bit. Um, I believe our ability to be honest with ourselves where we've had successes and where we still have challenges is imperative to making progress in this battle space. Uh, it's been said many times already during this conference that awareness is a challenge, and it remains so from my perspective. Um, it helps to have WPS champions, and we do have a handful, including certain combatant commanders who recognize the value of applying a gender perspective. Internally, though, we don't have enough awareness of WPS issues or priorities, either in our leadership ranks or even within our action arm ranks. There's training that happens, but neither its curriculum requirements or funding is fully standardized. Institutionally, we need to recognize WPS as a priority to reach the kind of critical mass needed to affect real awareness across the department. We need to have WPS awareness be integrated into priorities, evolutions, departments, both across organizations and up and down the food chain, from the strategic to the tactical levels, from training through to deeper education, research analysis, and probing understanding. For such penetrating concept diffusion, I believe, I believe it would be ideal to adopt a model like the Navy did with risk assessments. There was a time when we weren't very smart about the risks that we took, and we paid for it in blood and money. Now, we don't do an evolution or undertake a venture in the Navy without doing a thorough risk assessment and having an educated discussion about the risk and, risks and benefits of any activity. Risk assessments are part of our culture now, and they've saved many lives, limbs, and money. The same concept diffusion should and could, could, could and should be done with WPS concepts. 
Um, we've all heard of Pemisi, right? Uh, so imagine for a minute if instead of Pemisi, it was Pemisig, right? And, and Maybe you should explain. Yeah, so, so, so for those of you that don't know, Pemisi, <laughs> Pemisi is a, an acronym that is used in when you're, when you're planning missions and, and to make sure that you've covered all your bases, right? You've considered, so Pemisi, political, military, economic, social, informational, and, and infrastructure. So when, you're plan so when you're planning strategically, um, when you're planning operations, you go through that sort of that checklist to make sure you haven't missed anything, right? Imagine if, like, doctrinally, culturally, we applied gender perspective to everything that we did as well. That would that would be a mind shift. That would really uh, indicate that we that we have, you know, that concept of fusion that I was talking about. <clears throat> So there's many other things we could do, of course, institutionally. We're considering um, having annual action plans that would require, that would provide structure to annual goals and efforts, developing key leader engagement strategies, and holding seminars and conferences. Um, as has already been discussed, we recognize the need to incorporate WPS in, in PME, uh, as well as formalizing the training and command structure of our gender advisors and gender, gender focal points. Um, always open to constructive criticism. Uh, so please let me know, contact me if you have any suggestions or if you just want to brainstorm about, about ways that we can make this more a part of our culture. Um, so please give me a call. Always, always happy to entertain those conversations. It's been a great pleasure and honor participating in this conference with all of you. Um, this is an excellent event that brings together professionals from across the community of interest to discuss successes and challenges in this very important field that is recognized so easily by some and to which some are so resistant. Um, I look forward to continuing the dialogue with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Commander. And next we have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Benet. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to first thank the Naval War College and Mary for the invitation. It's very a great honor to be here today. Um, those platforms, I believe, are crucial uh, to share best practices and challenge our ideas on the topic. Uh, I'm an artillery officer. One year ago, I started my journey in the gender world uh, when I was assigned as the strategic gender advisor for the Canadian Armed Forces. And I have to say that uh, it's really been eye-opening at the past year for me. Um, so in the next 15 minutes, I will provide you a strategic um, overview of the Canadian Armed Forces implementation of the WPS portfolio. I'll try to do that uh, touching on a 360 degree approach, which means try to touch on the strategic, operational, and tactical level, both also internal to our forces and external uh, to the area of operation. Uh, but to do so, I will first address in the first place the past 18 months uh, where the Chief of Defense Staff, the CDS, issued his first direct direction on 1325. And the second part of my presentation will be more a look, at, a look ahead uh, based on the new defense uh, Canadian uh, pol uh, defense policy that was released. Uh, to do that, I will address some teams. Uh, I will talk about uh, the tool that we use, so gender-based analysis was. I will talk about the strategy we employ. I will also talk about some outputs and outcomes and the way I do the defense policy. So first, let's talk about gender-based analysis was. So before I explain what it is, just by a show of hands, who have heard about that before? That's good, there's a few. Uh, who have done the online course? Anyone? The gender-based analysis class course. Yeah. Okay, so um, so in Canada, the incorporation of the gender perspective is carried out through uh, the commitment to gender-based analysis class. Gender-based analysis class, or GBA class, is an analytical tool used to assess the potential impacts of policy programs uh, uh, initiatives and other type uh, and other initiative on diverse group of women and men, taking into account uh, gender and other identity factors. 
In 1995, the government of Canada committed to using GBA Plus to advance gender equality in Canada as part of the ratification of the United Nations uh, Region Platform for Action. The plus in the, in the GBA Plus highlights that gender goal, that, uh, that GBA goes beyond, beyond gender and include the examination of a range of other intersecting factors uh, like age, education, language, geography, culture, income, physical disability, etc. So if you want to know more about GBA Plus and that uh, community government initiative, you can go online, Google GBA Plus, and you can also take the course. It's an hour long course. Uh, so I would be curious to see your comments about that course. This is a course that is given to all the government, government of Canada department that have to be taken. And there's also a couple of uh, very interesting videos online. So if you Google GBA Plus, go in the video section, there's a couple of videos. So now let's talk about the strategy. So in January 2016, Chief of the Defense Staff issued his first direction on how to implement 1325 GBA Plus and CNAP requirement. Um, and his end state was that gender perspective of GBA plus become incorporated as a routine and common element of CAF activities. To support this, two lines of effort were identified. The first line of effort talks about operational effects. So it really focused on the integration of gender perspective into the planning, execution, and evaluation of the operation. It also include the initial education and training analysis and the initial establishment of gender advisor. This line of effort uh, has to be achieved by August uh, 2017, so this month. The second line of effort talks about the institutional effects. So I will focus on embedding 1325 requirements into CAF approach to leadership, management, command and control, uh, including all the education, the policy, um, material acquisition, and so on and so forth. And this line of effort has to be achieved by March 2019. At the current stage, the uh, strategic uh, staff, which is myself, is working on a flag <laughs> order, <laughs> so a supplementary order to the CBS direction to provide more direction uh, to the Canadian Armed Forces on how to implement those line of effort. Uh, now let's talk about some outputs or some of the key initiatives we've been we have seen since the issue of the first directive of the CDS in 2016, and we can group them in four teams. Uh, one would be uh, gender capacity, training and education, accountability mechanism, and international engagement. So in terms of capability, uh, we obviously uh, have Canadian Armed Forces have established gender advisor positions. So there's three right now. One at the strategic level two at the operational level, one for the spatial forces coming and one for the operational coming. So those gender advisors are full-time employed, trained at NCGM in Sweden, and this is, this is who we are. We then also have allocated a champion. So uh, she is a general two-star, uh, Major General Tammy Harris, which is the GBA Plus and WPS champion. Uh, the good thing about, about having a champion is when I first was assigned in my position, I kind of asked her what exactly my role was in, uh, in relation to her, and what she said is, whenever you have a problem pushing your file, you come see me. Even though I report directly to the director of staff, so I have my own chain of command, I know I always have a champion to help me when I have any difficulty or any encounter any uh, reticence to pushing files. So it's, it's for that point of view, it was very helpful. We also established another position. It's a civilian position, uh, current, full current equivalent. It's the Director of Integration of Gender Perspective. And she oversees the entire Canadian Armed Forces in, uh, Integration of Gender Perspective. So she's my boss. And we finally have also included gender focal points, both uh, in the institution, but also into operations, uh, from strategic to tactical level. So this is the gender capacity we have. In terms of training and education, we included GBA Plus as part of the uh, Common Professional Development Program, both for non-commissioned members and also officers. Um, we also rely heavily on NCGM in Sweden for gender training, and we're currently looking at developing probably our national forces uh, on gender. 
Thirdly, in terms of accountability, we are in the process to release our second edition of the National Action Plan. It should be released in the next weeks or months, soon, very soon. We also established um, the UNSCR 1325 Implementation Working Group. So this working group is at a strategic level, and the aim is really to uh, collaborate in developing, implementing, monitoring, evaluating, and reporting on the execution uh, of the plan to integrate the requirement of 1325. So it's chaired by myself, and we meet quite, uh, quarterly with all the uh, L1 or the, the company uh, that we can uh, enforce it. We also have other initiatives like the, uh, uh, the departmental GDA Plus annual survey, where we need to report on the progress of implementation of GDA Plus. And we also have some international engagement. Uh, one of the big ones uh, recently was the 5i Plus Gender Conference, where Canada hosted a three day conference in Ottawa in May. Uh, over 10 countries were uh, uh, present, and uh, we really focused on the integration of gender perspective at the operational level in operation. And that was a platform really to share best practices at the working level uh, environment. So, quickly, and one of the outcomes, so we've seen already some impact on the application of gender perspective and operation. And one of the great example was uh, during the, uh, uh, in May 2017, during the Quebec province flooding, so the Canadian Armed Forces were called to assist the uh, civil, um, um, to call the provincial government. And, um, so one of the key steps to the success to implementation of gender perspective during this uh, domestic operation was that at the, uh, from the, the start, the division commander in charge of the troops uh, made it very clear in his mandate and in his order to his troop that GBA plus will be applied into the planning and execution of this operation. But then they deployed gender focal point with uh, civilian military cooperation or civic team uh, on the ground so they could find uh, in their part of their daily street patrol, not only people who might be affected differently by the disaster, but who might access relief efforts differently as well. Then the division uh, staff also use uh, open sources uh, uh, to uh, tools to identify neighborhoods in the area of operation where uh, high numbers of elderly residents with low income or single parents also, or linguistic minority were were exactly located. And uh, the civic training coupled with the GBA plus consideration helped them identify those segments of the population, especially vulnerable to the flooding situation, who might be uniquely affected or have little access to support network. So by better understanding the difference of those all those intersecting factors in the area of operation like age, language, physical disability, familial situation, and how those factors were intersecting with the conduct of the operation, including the allocation of resources, uh, the division were able to have a more comprehensive assessment of the problem and adapt their action plan to increase the effectiveness of the operation. It was observed that not all the local population in Quebec needed the same resources at the same time, at the same location, or deliver the same way. And this is why when we apply gender perspective, uh, it enabled us to understand. Finally, if we look ahead and look at the Canadian, uh, the Canada Defense Policy that was released in May, uh, if you want to have a look at it, uh, you can Google, it's called Strong, Secure and Engage, Canada Defense Policy. And if you just Google uh, Control F Search, Women, Peace and Security, it's very optimistic because uh, there's a lot of mention in it. Um, the defense policy really offer clear direction in Canadian defense priorities over a 20-year horizon. The policy is deliberately ambitious and focuses first and foremost on the heart of the on the heart of the cap, the women and men who wear the uniform. Policy says, quote, working to implement and advance the WPS agenda would be an important aspect of, of Canada's international military engagement in peace operation and in building the capacity of others, end of quote. I just I want to finish by highlighting three of the main themes that are in defense policy that touch on the WPS. So one of them is, it talks about diversity. And it says that, uh, 
the, the, the policy says to promote privacy and inclusion as a core institutional value across the defense. The second one talks about increasing the percentage of women in the forces. Currently, Canadian armed forces have 15 percent of women. The NATO average of women in the military is 11 percent. The CAF is now committed to increase the representation of women by 1 percent annually um, for a goal of 25 percent in 10 years. This will not only contribute to a positive CAF culture change, but will also increase overall operational effectiveness. It will also directly address one of the key provisions of UNCR 1325 to increase the representation of women at all decision-making levels. And finally, it talks about integrating gender-based analysis plus that will allow to better understand the global security environment by achieving a deeper and more sophisticated understanding of the root causes of conflict with a view of playing a greater role in conflict prevention and minimizing the effect on prolonged conflict. GBA plus analysis is a key tool in the analysis of the security environment of an ongoing basis. So I guess in conclusion, uh, the past 18 months and the key initiative that I've mentioned earlier uh, were where I see the key enabler in, in this past 18 months and the success we had with it was uh, directly linked to the enablers, uh, was really linked to the buy-in and the engagement of the leadership from our prime minister to our minister of national defense to our chief of staff, uh, chief of defense staff, sorry, and also to the involvement of our WPS champion. If we look ahead, what I personally think will be a core team that we need to address is training. Um, so that's basically it. I hope it, it uh, really give you a quick overview of what we've been doing the past 18 months and where we want to go in the next decade or so in terms of our WPS uh, perspective. Thank you, Colonel. And next we'll have Professor Vilches. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity offered by the Women Peace and Security Organization. I'm um, very to be able to, to present this idea. I hope I do feel, feel, feel interesting. Um, in this exhibition, I will address uh, two issues of the image of woman through the Women Minister of Defense in Spain. Uh, I analyzed the main newspaper and the graphic material. Uh, to know the relevance of women presence in high position of responsibility and security models. Uh, what is the Ministry of Defense in, in Spain? Uh, Spain is a democracy since uh, 1977 after the dictatorship General Franco. From this moment, a democratic model is established in which the sovereignty, <laughs> sorry for my English, uh, reside in the citizen. Like any other democracy from its beginning, this one has been uh, evolving, adapting to the new times. With the passion of time, the woman has been having more present and his present is relevant, more relevant. Uh, in Spain, by means of the vote of the Congress of the Deputies, is configured. The deputies who form each elect by vote uh, to which will be the president of the government. And this in short chooses the equipment of minister with which it go to work. In this term is where you choose who will be the Minister of Defense. The Minister of Defense was spread with the first uh, democratic government of Adolfo Suarez in uh, July in 1977 and married the former Ministry of the Army, Navy and Air Force. It is the only ministry of the democratic period that has kept its original name in all ministerial restructuring carried to date. Uh, how does the Ministry of Defense work? The Ministry of Defense in Spain, according to different surveys, surveys is the most burdened of all ministries in, in the government. In Spain, the work carried out by the armed force is one of the most valued by uh, the work of the public administration. Oh. 
uh, this work in defense usually requires more recognition by the citizen and the population. Uh, the Minister of Defense is not usually a military person. Uh, uh, he was only the first in the democracy when he was still in a period of transition. Usually the Ministry of Defense is a civilian, a politician, uh, and since 1977, uh, the first, we have, uh, we have had 15 ministers, uh, of whom only two have been women, only two, and in recent time, is the chain, the adapting of the new time. Uh, the Ministry of Defense in political area is one of the most secret ministers. Uh, this is because the minister each, uh, in charge is usually not a minister who goes uh, away. Uh, this minister is usually well regarded with regard to citizen and population. It, uh, don't, it doesn't matter uh, the home decision as much as does the are taking in international organization, alliance, etc. Uh, decisions are more the decision of other. Uh, in general, whenever uh, ministers are appointed, intrigues are often inflicted by, the, uh, by those who occupy each ministry, and we, they are relevant by the media. There is always some guess as to a uh, reason why the candidate has been chosen. In the case of Minister Chacon, the first minister uh, woman, by the media, the coverage and the amount of information was very great. Uh, the mayor, the mayor present of the minister in act of the ministry was new, only the present. Uh, it was uh, the first time uh, this happened, and also in condition uh, that made it even more striking. She was pregnant. <laughs> in the second case, with the minister Cospedal, uh, uh, the actual minister, uh, this still was not so great. Uh, the important thing in the second case is what no longer a woman. That was a question in surplus. This is Minister Chacon. Chacon was born in Barcelona and did the last, uh, the last uh, April. <coughs> was a lawyer and university professor uh, uh, rather than political. Uh, it, uh, I always had a close connection with the uh, Socialist Party. Uh, on April, uh, in April uh, 2008, seven months pregnant, she became the first Minister of Defense uh, of Spain and the Spanish Prime Minister who agreed to a pregnant ministry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which, has, which was a wider spread on the rest of the Europe due to its exceptionality. Uh, among her first decisions was uh, the visit to the Spanish troops of the Spanish detachment in Herat, uh, Afghanistan, this, uh, this picture. Um, the image uh, reviving the troop, this, uh, this picture, uh, the troop in Afghanistan, seven months pregnant, uh, become one of the icon, uh, they come of the government of the uh, Jose Luis uh, Rodriguez Zapatero. Zapatero had put a, a, a woman more traditional, masculine, at the head of the ministry and had uh, done it uh, knowing that she was in the final stretch of her pregnancy. Uh, note, uh, the presence of woman in the army, note, uh, 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 the presence of woman in the army becomes uh, more noticeable. Uh, in this moment. Women in the military are the same, the number is the same, but now they appear more in the photographs and media. We can see, or never, uh, it's not usually uh, a woman in military in photographs. Uh, she was uh, uh, 15, 15, 17 years old when she was admitted to the position. She declared, she declared, pregnant or not, I was clear that my first obligation was to visit who, those who are capable of putting their life at risk for higher values, the freedom of the others. 
Uh, it is harder to be a cashier and to stand all day. Uh, I wanted to express the gratitude of society to those who take rights for there to be peace in region and conflict. Another relevant moment uh, was with the military Easter. I don't know who translates it exactly. Military Easter. This is an official act, um, very careful, in which a minister, without leaving the protocol, a pair of the thread appeared, dressed in shadow, uh, and not with a dress or was customary among women who attended this act. Uh, was player. Never any of these women had been the minister. It's exceptionality. Uh, this is the now uh, currently uh, Minister of Defense, Maria Dolores de Cospedal. Maria Dolores de Cospedal uh, was born in Madrid in uh, 1965. Is a lawyer, a state lawyer, uh, and a Spanish policy, Prime uh, Minister of Defense. She is in Popular Party, the more or less opposite. Now it's not the opposite, but in different uh, sense for uh, politics than socialist party. Uh, <coughs> uh, the last of October in 2016, uh, Mariano Rajoy uh, was inaugurated as president of the government of Spain and on the, the 3rd of November announced the composition of his second executive with Mada Maria Dolores de Cospedal being appointed minister of defense. On 4 November, she voted her position in presence of the king uh, and took office as minister receiving the defense portfolio from the hand of his predecessor, Pedro Morenes. Amen. Uh, she is the second woman in, in chair after Carmen Chaco. Um, and in this moment, I asked me uh, uh, what happened? What happened for this situation? Uh, and asked me, what is the glass shelling? There are uh, glass shelling, it's broken. Uh, in what is the glass shelling? It's glass shelling is to, to the bailout limitation of the level increase of the women inside the organization. This is a shelling that limits their professional careers, difficult to overcome, and that prevents uh, them from further progress. It is invisible because there are no established or official social uh, laws or devices that impose an explicit limitation on the labor career of women. The term glass sailing barrier is appeared in uh, 1986 Wall Street Journal article in the United States. The article, des the article described the invisible barrier faced by highly skilled women worker who were enabled to reach the highest hierarchical levels in business world, regardless of their achievements and merit. Since then, several scholars in sociology and other areas have described this concept as reference to uh, women's world science. Uh, uh, women make up half of the world population, but to be a disproportionality uh, low percentage of management position. Um, through the, uh, the 15 years uh, of work of the Minister Chacón in the forefront of, of the Spanish politics, Carmen Chacón wanted to break the glass ceiling that prevents women from, uh, from rising to first place in their careers. Chacón got it in, got in several areas, in addition to begin to the first woman named Defense Minister. Uh, she was also the first to arrive at the ministry while pregnant, and, this, and in the second case, the saying was broken. It's more, more easy, it's surpassed. Uh, similarity or difference between, between two cases. Between the two women uh, has defense portfolio holders, they can difference between two completely different style of government uh, related with the media, social, or no. Uh, in the analysis of the press material made from the main uh, Spanish newspaper, the results are very interesting. 
uh, <coughs> the newspaper analysis have been, I don't know if you uh, know, uh, El País, El Mundo, ABC, Spanish, <laughs> and the Vanguard, the, La Vanguardia. Offshoot, uh, offshoot newspaper has an analysis, the photograph that has <coughs> a component in the new uh, news rating. In all this news, that had the name of the one of the two ministers. The photograph of most cases were provided by the Minister of Defense itself, or in one way or another, uh, they were managed by the ministry. Uh, we find the mail referring to the Minister Chacon, uh, where the vast majority refers to images that seek to make a stronger position as woman in the ministry. Uh, when on the side of the Ministry Cospeda, the second, uh, what we think is to generate a masculinity, masculinity image or, or more aseptic or politic. Uh, no, no, uh, the news don't speak about if she, she is a woman, if she is a woman in power position. Uh, both ministers reflect very different images, uh, although both be, uh, being of different political parties. It's important, it's fundamental, but um, have defended the position of women with respect to having responsibility and security and defense area. Uh, yeah. uh, good. Of note oh, is the image of the Ministry Chacon revealing the Spanish troop in Afghanistan pregnant seven month is uh, the more important and the more uh, reply. Re 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 <laughs> The image is iconic uh, of what is the step of the minister by the ministry. It is the most reproduced and recognized image in the minister. The other most notable image is the style she wore in a tuxedo at the minister in the, um, at the military Easter, where usually this clothes is reserved for men and women wear a long dress, uh, usually. Both images are transgressor to the institutionalism institutionalist system. Uh, on, the, on the death of Carmen Chacon, the head of Defense Hospital, said that she showed her respect to Chacon as a Spanish woman and also as a minister. It is uh, through the minister Chacon who, uh, for whom the glass ceiling uh, is broken and the contribution of women is strategic as the space of a space of peace and international security from the Spanish state itself. Um, ah. uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention. I thought uh, to have contributed uh, some relevant idea uh, on how women in Spain work in peace and security. Thank you very much and sorry for my English. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. And next, we'll have uh, Ms. Davis. <laughs> thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to thank all of you for your absolutely inspirational and empowering work in the field. And thank you, Dr. Brown, for giving me an opportunity to share about Russia's women peace and security experience. And um, I feel humbled going to be considered to present at this year forum. And please be patient with me. English is still my second language, and uh, I speak with an accent, so I'll speak slow and stick to the script. So I'm passionate about the subject because I was born and raised in Russia. My grandmother worked as a passport control officer at the local police department for over 30 years. My mother worked as an engineer at the uh, satellite construction and testing plant in Siberia, also over 30 years. So we were part of women, peace, and security experience in the Soviet Union and later after the breakup of the Soviet Union in Russia. So my hope is that my knowledge and my research somehow contribute to the knowledge um, in the field of women, peace, and security. and. Um, help us to explore new venues for cooperation between our countries and Russia, engaging Russian women. 
Russian cultural attitudes historically and currently dictate the role of women's, um, women's role in peace and security. A knowledge of Russia's history and national identity enable us to adopt culture-sensitive policies that would empower Russian women and effectively engage them in the process of peace and women, peace and security and national stability. And it will allow us to operationally to advance our agenda, our goal, um, amplify women peace and security agenda. So I'll begin with explanation of how cultural attitudes of the patriarchal society as Russia is shape the status and role of women, focusing on two words, allow and need. And these two words help to explain the reality that cultural attitudes in Russia are primarily found on tradition of Russian Orthodox Church. And the last point would be that cultural attitudes are very slow to evolve, but the new trends, they are developing and trending in a new way, challenging the tradition and challenging the perspectives in the society because there is a need and that need allows women to take more active part in the society. And similar to women in other countries as we heard during the conference, Russian women participate in different activities of the state. However, the difference is the motivation and commitment of the government and perspective of the majority in Russia regarding women in the society. And this kind of perspective and everything is depends on cultural attitudes of the patriarchal society that shapes status and role of women. In Russia, women allow to participate in diplomacy, intelligence, military, economy, when there is a need to fill the gap due to a lack of capable men to do the job. According to Rostat, um, the Russia's Federal Statistics Service, as of January 2016, women comprise 54% of the total population of Russia. The Russian government, faced with the demographic and current economic crisis, recognizes the need to allow women to participate in the fields that historically have been traditionally male fields, as a military, heavy industry, government. However, only few women can reach some sort of decision-making position in the government or in the military or any other fields, any other organizations. And according to the Deputy Prime Minister of Russian Federation, woman, Olga Galadets, women in Russia are more educated than men, but still face discrimination in the workforce. Like for example, 37% of women in Russia have a college education, which is 8% higher than men. However, women's salary is still at the 73% of men's, even though women work much harder to achieve any high positions and performing even performing double duty at home and at work. And such discrimination is due to traditional perception of women in the society and role in the society, which is a man is to be a breadwinner and a woman is to take care of the household and the family in addition to pursue her career advancement. And growing up in Russia, like I witnessed how my mother or our friends it was challenging for my mother to balance work and home, working full time, taking care of us, and managing the entire household. My brother and I grew up in a state-run daycare, school, summer camps. I turned out okay, I think. Um, <laughs> but women in Russia indeed are very resilient. And yet historically, and Currently, women in Russia are grossly underrepresented in traditional positions of power and still face many discrimination and challenges. And why is that? Um, that brings a second point. To explain the complexity of Russia's women's peace and security experience, it is necessary to provide a historical background, the root of such traditional perspectives and challenges. 
Cultural attitudes in Russia are mainly found on the tradition of the Russian Orthodox Church since the introduction of Christianity into Kiev's Garus in the 9th century. The Church defined primary role of a woman as a pious and supportive wife and a good mother responsible for rearing children and managing the household. But there was a need to keep order in the state and in the family unit. And the Church teaching to fear God and endure sufferings became an, an instrument of Tsar's powers. Enforcement of the Mastoy rule, which is literally building of the household and management of the household, has endured in Russia since 16th century when it was first introduced, shaping cultural perspective and cultural attitudes. The Mastoy described the ideal family and its management where everyone knew his or her role. And it reads, a God-fearing wife had to be obedient to her husband at all times, follow his instructions, and could be disciplined if not compliant. And this demonstrate was um, currently resurrected uh, by the church and the government during the recent debate over decriminalization um, of domestic violence law earlier this year that Professor Briggs mentioned in her presentation yesterday. So that was the base and that was the foundation. And throughout history, when leaders recognized that national peace and security were closely connected to empowerment of women to to seek education and to find their voice in the society, stability and prosperity of the state and its allies followed. And one of the most significant demonstrations of the empowerment of women was during the rule of Tsar Peter the Great. He desired to see Russia equal to European great powers, and therefore there was a necessity for women's participation. There was a need that, again, the need of women participation in the society and they were allowed to pursue education and lead in many areas of the society. And Tsar Peter's initiatives resulted in the age of the emperor's rule in Russia, that up to his death in the early 18th century. Six emperors who defied cultural attitudes and even rebelled against the church rules, they ruled the nation for nearly a century advancing that vision that Peter the Great established at the very beginning of his rule. And after emancipation of Serbs in 1861, followed by industrialization and urbanization in Russia, many emancipated peasants moved from villages to cities. Women's labor at that point contributed to manufacturing, expanding commerce, social services. A greater number of women became teachers doctors, factory workers. They became politically engaged in the society, actively participated in protest, political meetings, which ignited the revolution that changed the world. And the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 empowered women to push for legal equality. Women became, women were able to vote, they had access to education and to employment. And that changed cultural attitudes and perspective in Russia. Everyone in the Soviet Union became equal, equal comrades, dedicated to spread communism and socialism around the world, while still rebuilding the nation, all of them together. And they decried the Russian Orthodox Church and declared church as an enemy of state. During the World War II, women contributed significantly to the, to the war efforts. When there was a need, women were called to arms, took leadership of the factories and plants, collective farms, worked double shifts to simply to meet the needs of the war. Many served as nurses in the battlefields and became active combatants. And the Soviet government prided itself in the liberation and empowerment of women. Nevertheless, the Communist Party policies throughout the entire Soviet Union period addressing women issues um, 
were absolutely inconsistent. The policies reflected more of the agenda of the party, more than women's issues. And that became the trend in Russian society for the next century. And the last point, the cultural attitudes are slow to evolve, but changes are trending in a new way. And since the breakup of the Soviet Union, the level of women participation in the society is slowly changing. In September 1999, the president of Russia approved the decree allowing women to serve in the military as a volunteer of course. The conscript service in Russia is still required only for men. And according to Russia's Ministry of Defense, currently there are 45,000 women serving the military, which is approximately 10% of total military volunteer force in Russia. Women are allowed to serve in every military branch if there is vac vacancy and at the discretion and need of the Ministry of Defense. And the majority of women in all branches of the military are still in the support role, such as nurses, doctors, in communications, logistics, um, information technology. Similar to other nations' militaries, women are not allowed to serve in submarines. However, the reason for that, for the absence of female um, in the Russian Navy is different. Russia does not need women to serve on the subs because what? Because there are enough highly educated and trained men who are capable of serving and performing their duties. And this comment of Rear Admiral Viktor Kachimakov, Director of Military Training of Russia's Navy, reflects a common perspective about women's participation in the service and military. Women are allowed and can assist when there is a need, instead of extending equal opportunities to serve the country and people. And many male leaders still do not understand nor see the benefit of having women serving in their units. So also, женский вопрос, which is women question, very popular word in Russia. Russian term for a broad range of policies and on women issues has reemerged on government agendas. The process of empowering, empowering women are fully and fully engage them in the state, in every kind of activity of the state, is a very slow process. Russia is yet to join 66 nation states which have already adopted national, uh, national election plan to fulfill the provision uh, of UN Resolution 1325. However, there is a positive step in the right direction in Russia. There is hope. On the International Women's Day, still observed in Russia, on March 8, 2017, the Prime Minister uh, Dmitry Medvedev signed the National Strategy of Actions in the Interests of Women for the period 2017-2022. Additionally, it is Russia's Ministry of Defense, together with Ministry of Education, slowly change cultural attitudes. They largely invest in patriotic education of the youth, in addition to military training of the youth. So that also includes girls. This trend started in 2008, when the President of Russia signed an executive order allowing girls to study at the historical boys' military boarding schools and academies. Shortly thereafter, Minister, Ministry of Defense and Minister of Education established the first and only military boarding school for girls. It's called Moscow Cadet School, officially boarding school of military, um, boarding school of Ministry of Defense of Russian Federation. And in addition to this new trend, enabling girls to receive the, the best education through those military schools and academies. So in addition to this, enabling them to receive the best education and to expand their opportunities, the Russian government resurrected the idea of youth 
upbringing and education through indoctrination, similar to Soviet Union pioneers and council members that I'm responding. So that was very familiar to me, and that's a kind of alerted me. There is something new happening. So culturally, the younger generations are more, enthousi more enthusiastic about the new trends, especially if something was not previously allowed. And capitalizing on this enthusiasm, in May 2016, the Ministry of Defense established the National Youth Patriotic Movement Unarmia, which is Young Army. Currently, more than 100,000 Russian teenagers, 11 through 18 years old, boys and girls alike, learning about national interest, history, security, receive military training, holding like summer camps in the military exercises, all together. The girls embrace such opportunities because it allowed them to do what boys do, and which, face a, which changes cultural attitudes now. And these girls and boys, they are future decision makers. And they potentially can lead to a more active participation of women and men alike in a women's peace and security process. So in conclusion, all these historical and current trends in Russia confirm that Russian cultural -like attitudes, historically and currently, dictate Russian women's role in peace and security. The cultural attitudes primarily found on tradition of Russian Orthodox Church, which once again evolved from the enemy of the state to the instrument of the state that passionately advocates traditional values and still influences policies and public opinion. The Russian reality confirms that cultural attitudes are slow to change. However, changes are trending in a new way. Women are allowed to serve in the military, government, work in predominantly male industries, and have a better education and employment opportunities because there is a need to fill a gap in a manpower. And this knowledge enables us to explore new venues for cooperation between Russia and our countries, effectively engaging <coughs> Russian women in the, process, in the process of peace and security, and which allows us to achieve our goal, amplify women, peace and security agenda. Thank you. And spicy love. Side note from my 15 minutes that probably are over. <laughs> um, every issue, like in uh, mass media, like and this is the issue of uh, Minister of Defense publication, and they celebrated in May. They celebrated that Unarmia. They celebrated one year anniversary. All the pictures specifically picture girls, more girls than the boys just to show that they still think in this way. We need to really bring women on board, bring girls on board. And yes, there is that propaganda and indoctrination and everything, so we'll see how that will play out. But there is a venue for us to really engage them in the process in the right way, an effective way that contributes to peace and security in the world. So thank you. And if you're interested, you're more than welcome to look. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll open it now for is uh, for some questions. Mary. So Anna, I know you just finished talking, um, but I'm going to ask you a question. Anna. Sure. So we got a drink of water. Um, so I teach the history of women in war and combat here, and some of the best examples of female warriors come out of Russia. And in particular, Maria, and I don't know if I'm saying her name right, Maria Botskareva during World War One. Um, not because she she formed the Russian the Women's Battalions of Death. To me, that's the most uninteresting thing she did. The fact that she fought um, in the front lines with men as the only female is very interesting. Lilia lit back the White Rose of Russia and the Night Witches from World War II. So I was wondering, in Russia, are they considered heroines? Or as time goes on, do they disappear? Through propaganda, in other words, they're not important anymore. I know Maria Bachkareva fought for the White Army, so 
I don't think the communist system would appreciate her. Um, so I'm just wondering, are there female heroines that are talked about? Absolutely. And they still, um, in Russia, it's still especially now that the government really adopted that patriotic upbringing and almost that on the borderline with nationalism. It's not full-blown nationalism yet because Russian people tell me we cannot be nationalistic because we have a lot of different ethnicities and nations live in our country. But yet, it, it kind of going that way, which is a danger. But they bring back that history. They needed people to know the history. And absolutely, there are so many, especially during the Victory Day celebration, there are so many really in every venue of mass media and in the cities and the local level goes that find the heroes and talk to them because not many left. And I grew up on the military base in Russia and our field trips were to the barracks. Our like conferences were with the heroes of World War II. So that's there is a trend resurrected the same idea, and if you saw any military parades in Russia, especially around um, May 9th, the Victory Day in Russia, those who left, they are still there up front, together with the president, together with all the dignitaries. So yes, it is very much resurrected. I think it was the period when everything was a kind of slow, but now it's the new wave of patriotism or nationalism. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I have two questions actually for Ms. Davis as well. Thank you so much for your presentation. I just really appreciated hearing the You can hear the same very similar so notes. Similar. It's yep. amazing. Um, and I would love to learn more and read your work. Um, uh, first question is just about your research methods, especially the current as a resurrection of communist ideas or something. The attitude, they realizing we have more women in the society. And we have so many gaps in every industry, everywhere, where we need to fill those gaps. And that's when there is that, from that realization, they bring women into every area, in every field. Um, so that's, that's my understanding, but going into like how I do research and what I see, and especially when I started talking with Dr. Raum about this conference and what is the Russian, Russia's experience, it was extremely difficult to find anything in English. So I went to the Russian sources. And it's mainly what is published what is um, the current events, current use, and that's what research and analysis is the professor pointed later, like mass media, it's propaganda. So even there is information there, you still have to, you need to sift through what is propaganda, pure propaganda, and what is really what's going on. So if there are similar things in different sources, 
you take it and you analyze and you see and you compare. So that was pretty much what I did. And that's why I said that my research is mainly based on the Russian sources. So hope I answered the question because the they, I don't think that's what people are talking about resurrection of communism, and I don't think that it would be the case. Um, it's more really totalitarian regime, but not different from communism. So, and women are considered the force, like the working force that can produce so much. And we need to capitalize that. We need to utilize that to advance our agenda. And that's what a lot of people, even um, a lot of women in the government, it's only like six, seven percent in the government in both um, upper and lower branch of the government. They are used as megaphones for advancing the government's agenda. And the Russian Orthodox Church is also used like as an instrument, as I said, as an instrument of the government power to really push that agenda and um, influence the policies. And that's what the uh, domestic violence, decriminalization of domestic violence law was heavily engaged Russian Orthodox Church that shaped that perspective. Women role is in house. Not that they are against them to go in the workforce, but they need to figure out their priorities and stay them straight. So that's the basic attitude and a very kind of short, brief way to explain it. Thank you. I'll go over here next. Thank you. Sure. Only people we agree with inclusive security. Um, my question is for Colonel Began. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, first of all, I wanted to congratulate you in Canada on your Gender Plus training. We often say that women's peace and security is not just about women, it's about also an entry point to other marginalized voices participating directly in these processes. So, you know, real kudos to Canada that you guys are demonstrating that with your Gender Plus training. Um, my question is about uh, Canada's National Action Plan. Um, as I'm sure you know, there's um, often some controversy around maps and whether or not they're effective or if they're the best policy mechanism for implementing this agenda. Uh, the most common criticism being that, you know, they can often be window dressing. So I wanted to ask you if you could reflect maybe a little bit on some of the, what you see as some of the successes and failures of Canada's NAP, especially as you're now on the verge of launching your second. Well, thank you for the question. Um, with my <laughs> one year experience in my position, <laughs> I'll try to give you the best answer as I, could, as I can. Um, what I've seen is, I, when I arrived last year in position, we were starting the process of writing our new National Action Plan. So I've, I've participated in that past year in the, the writing of the new National Action Plan. Uh, one, one thing I've seen, one of, what, what is, one of the challenges is when it talks about uh, evaluation and uh, does that really work. So I find that we're really good at when we look at measure of performance, we're really good at how many people have to get training, how many, how many numbers, numbers, numbers. Where the challenge is, is when we look at measure of effect effectiveness. And, and that's not only for National Action Plan, that's for pretty much, in my opinion, it can apply to every, everything. But measure of effectiveness is really hard to, to, to show and demonstrate. And this is where, in my opinion, we're, we're struggling with. So even though we have, let's say, 75% of our courses that, that have took that courses online, are they applying it in the planning of their version? And are they applying it correctly? And if they apply it correctly, does that really increase our operational effectiveness? So this is, in my opinion, the, the challenge. Um, one thing that I've seen from the first edition of the National Action Plan to the second edition is we are, in the second edition, we are devising the action plan by annexes. So uh, the Department of National Defense and the Canadian Armed Forces will have its own annex so we can focus on tasks uh, more precisely to D&D and CAF so when it's time to evaluate and report on it, uh, we'll have uh, it's four or five teams, uh, governance, training, and so on and so forth. So I guess we'll, 
it won't make us more or less accountable, but maybe a little clearer to look at who's in charge of what in terms of reporting and reporting on the national action plan. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, I also had a question. Uh, you mentioned your internal processes for natural disasters, and I was curious to know how it was being implemented uh, for the current wildfire in what part of the Thank you for your question. Um, so it's it's really the way we work and the way we receive those, we were able to see those effects on the ground is by the employment of gender focal points. So when we stood up that direct directive in January, in January 16, the operational level uh, develop a structure of gender focal points, uh, which are uh, individual that are identified in every organization as a dual added as their job is, they have a, their primary job, but their secondary job is to look at integrating gender perspective. So having those gender focal points from a strategic to tactical level is one of the key enablers that help us to uh, integrate gender perspective when it's time for domestic operation like the flooding, fireworks. Um, at this stage, it's a little bit early to give you all the findings of if we have applied it and what were the operational effectiveness, but the gender advisor, the operational level, is currently uh, in liaison with the gender focal point, which is in Victoria right now, working at consolidating all the, uh, the data. So I'll be more than happy to share with you the findings uh, when this is, uh, when the fires are, are ended and we can consolidate uh, concrete examples out of it. Um, and side with that, we're also trying to do, develop micro-learning videos out of those examples so we can use that in training our own forces because uh, I find that the best way to train our military personnel is to show concrete practical example of gender perspective. So we're trying to do one right now on the flooding situation. Um, I'm not sure when it's going to be ready, but I'm, open. I'm really happy to share that with you when it's going to be produced. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Court Commander Mayor. Suzanne, what's your biggest challenge when it comes to WPS? Um, thank you for that question. Um, the, so, like I mentioned, um, I've been doing this since since April. It's when I checked on board and took over for Elaine, who did a phenomenal job um, with little resources. As I mentioned, I'm I'm the action officer for the Joint Staff, and and OSD is kind of going through some. Um, manning challenges as is the rest of across the whole of government right now we're, we're seeing a lot of gaps and so I would say probably the resources of time time money and people um, to devote to this battle space uh, is probably one of the biggest challenges three of the biggest challenges <laughs> um, because there I think there's a lot that needs to be done there's a lot that can be done but it but it requires you know brain power bandwidth and and so really um, Finding the time to devote to that is is challenging. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done, but there's only so many hours in the day, and there's only so many so many people working on it at, at this level. So. Thank you. I have another question. Is there anyone else raising their hands? Nope. So Maria, um, your study. The reason I chose that study is I just thought it was interesting that you were looking at women defense ministers, so I was curious, and I haven't been able to ask you, are you also looking at the business sector? What other sorts of um, interests do you have in terms of the female population in the country? In the business sector, uh, the, the woman is more present than in the public administration. Okay. It's, uh, uh, the number is, uh, Higher and the position is more relevant. Uh, we have a uh, woman in the head of the more important bank, uh, financial sector is more relevant in Spain. But uh, now in this moment, we uh, we have to su surprise the economic crisis. And her, uh, her, uh, in that uh, that position is uh, very important for to improve the, the rate of the state and it's a hard, hard woman uh, and in the public administration uh, there are we have a, a lot of presence of women a high 
it's not a 50-50 uh, with men, but, uh, but it's not uh, it's not like a business sector is. In business sector is uh, uh, have a process of empowerment more higher than in the public administration or the local. Thank you for the question. All right, please join me in thanking panel seven for this.